Chapter 28, Gone Hunting. I wasn't better after my month off, but I still had to work. I drove Gringo's undercover car to the Easy Rider Bike Expo in Charlotte, North Carolina to hunt the enemy. An outlaw named Tomcat, a former enforcer turned treasurer for the main chapter, rode with me. A transplant from the West Coast, we had much in common. As a former Marine and hardcore drug dealer, a coyote, who once smuggled human cargo across the border from Mexico, I actually understood Tomcat. We spoke the same language, knew the same places. He cooperated my backstory, and maybe that instilled his trust in me. When we arrived at the expo, we parked in a back alley on the lookout for the Hells Angels. Eminem had conferred with the Outlaws' national boss and leaders ordered members from Boston, Maine, and Virginia to be prepared for war. All of us were ordered to shoot Hells Angels on sight, but I knew that no Hells Angels would appear. The Outlaws ruled Charlotte. Easy Rider wasn't their event. Hells Angels steered clear of an ambush. Still, the ATF, eager to capture recorded conversations of outlaws plotting murder against their rival, concocted a ruse. An agent stationed in Charlotte contacted Eminem, the outlaws' enforcer, on the phone and alerted him to possible trouble. Our sources say the Hells Angels plan to make an appearance at the Easy Rider show. You can't stop them, it's a public venue. There better be a brawl. Of course, there would be, but the government hoped for reaction, outrage from the outlaws, and the clubs promised to shoot Hells Angels on sight if provoked. The outlaws played right into the agents' hands as they set up human blockades and prepared to execute strays. After six hours of nothing, I relaxed somewhat. Tomcat, maybe bored or restless, revealed that he had done something really bad that necessitated his having to change all his truck tires. My heartbeat increased. My hand shook as I reached inside my front pocket for my recorder and pushed the on switch, but the button snapped. Tomcat's dark eyes flashed in the dull afternoon sky. He stroked his small caliber handgun in his lap and reflected that he enjoyed maggot hunting, our name for Hell's Angels. It was something that came naturally to him. I said nothing, afraid to move, to shift, worried that he might suddenly stop talking. I need to take a piss, he said, and opened the door. Meanwhile, I quietly snapped pictures of the gun he left on the seat with my cell phone and texted the images to the cover team. His need to urinate had disrupted the flow of conversation. Tomcat never elaborated on his really bad thing, and I had no way of re-engaging him without arousing his suspicion. A lost confession, a broken recorder, words drifting into space. Eventually, I learned that he and Madman, the enforcer for the main chapter, had gunned down a Hells Angel in Maine on Milwaukee Jack's orders. He wanted revenge. Madman testified later in federal court. Weeks earlier, Hells Angels had beaten with ball-peen hammers two outlaws at a gas station in Connecticut. Milwaukee Jack told us to get two vests, however you can get them, or kill a Hells Angel. He told Madman to take care of business. Madman and Tomcat had simply followed his orders. They began hunting in Maine. Chilled, they stopped first for coffee at a cafe near a Hells Angels clubhouse. Madman, formerly a member of the Exiles and Hells Angels Support Club, spotted an old friend driving by in his pickup truck. Madman and Tomcat followed the Hells Angel to his clubhouse, waited for him to open his door and open fire. Bullets shattered the Hells Angels windshield lodged in the side of his truck and riddled the right side of his body. Days later, Madman called JD. I need a place to stay. He sounded frantic, breathless. With all the attention in Maine, he needed to leave town in a hurry. He and Tomcat arrived at our clubhouse close to midnight. JD ushered them inside. They sported new patches on their cuts, SS bolts. Madman paced our living room, skittish and pale, agitated by any sudden noise. Tomcat sat there coolly, staring straight ahead in stunned silence. He lifted his shirt, traced fresh lightning bolts tattooed on his belly, and flashed me his new SS pin. That Hell's Angel wasn't the target, he whispered. We sat in the dark. Occasional headlights flashed over his face. He was a crime of opportunity. Tomcat's pat explanation chilled me. I thought about the number of times I had idled my engine in our clubhouse driveway, afraid to open the door. The Hells Angels shooting had been so random, so quick, 
I worried about ambush too, about being someone else's opportunity. At least he didn't die. Tomcat shrugged as if that made the shooting okay. No, but the Hell's Angel would be on a ventilator for life. Tomcat bunched up his face, looking like a child who had just cut the tail off a cat. Not so bad, the animal still had legs and a head. Let's suppose that main thing was done by an outlaw, he continued. I'll tell you how it happened. I couldn't believe it. He was actually going to confess. The H.A. looked at him funny. What do you mean? Looked at him like, what the fuck you looking at, bro? And then BAM! Tomcat mimicked the Hells Angel's surprise and then the outlaw's reaction as if he were staring at himself in the mirror trying on different expressions. I'm not afraid of the Hells Angels. He hugged his arms around his chest. I'm afraid of the cops. He displayed the hilt of his gun tucked into his waistband. Shit. I'm afraid to mow my lawn. I take my gun with me when I take a piss. I swallowed and pretended to be sympathetic. They're not coming for you, bro. They're coming. Tomcat's eyes watered. I can feel them. He described them like ghosts. Ever try shooting a ghost? My gun jammed, Madman explained later in his federal trial. Tomcat wanted to finish him off. He emptied his gun into the Hells Angels truck and reloaded. But Madman objected. I wanted my gun to jam. I pulled lightly on the trigger. Madman demonstrated for the jury. Tomcat, he's the Madman. Following the shooting, Madman tossed their guns over a bridge into a raging river. He gazed at the panel with large sleepy eyes, his head pronounced and unframed by a skullcap. In bold black ink across his throat, he had tattooed mom. You feel let down? The prosecutor added. For all of Madman's bravado, none of the outlaws had visited him in prison. A little, Madman shrugged. Once a former wrestler, he shriveled on the stand. You feel used? I followed orders. Milwaukee Jack told you to sell drugs? He said times are tough. Brothers need to do what they need to do to get by. Even kill. Madman didn't respond. Didn't disclose that Milwaukee Jack's orders to kill had been revised. That he was supposed to just say, fuck him up. Murder was expensive. The outlaws devised a scheme to increase club profits. Little Dave, the Copper Region Vice President, suggested we install illegal gambling machines in our Petersburg clubhouse. After all, the Lexington chapter had successfully recouped nearly $24,000 in profits over the last eight months. The outlaws used the funds to pay club dues and outstanding bills. If we owned such machines, little Dave coaxed, we too could earn revenue for our chapters. It sounded like a good idea, but not for the reasons little Dave recited. We figured with the gambling machine in our clubhouse, we could entice outlaws to play right into our hands. That was the fascination of undercover work. Improvisation sometimes led to chance revelations, to exactly the criminal enterprise we hoped to label and ultimately convict the outlaws. The machines arrived the next day. They resembled video arcade machines, but a simple switch converted the screens to poker and blackjack. The owners, stone-faced mafia thugs, reviewed with us the operating rules. They expected to receive 40% of our profits. One wore diamond studs in his right lobe, a garish ring on his pinky, and a thick gold necklace that surrounded his throat like rope. The other looked half-formed, as if he had spurted from a tube into a fleshy blob and forgot to stretch. Smashed in and undefined, he had a lazy eye that made it impossible to look at him when he spoke. I added gambling to my job description and regularly fed the machines with government funds, mindful of entrapment. Soon, other outlaws who visited our clubhouse took my cue. And once a month, the mafia men returned to collect. Meanwhile, Eminem grumbled that he needed help with the background investigations. He complained at a recent church meeting about being short-staffed and the paperwork was mountainous. Hearing Eminem's whines, I proposed to Gringo that he volunteer for the position at the next boss's meeting. Why not? It was a way in, a way to manipulate the game and make Eminem think it was his idea. Gringo insisted to Eminem that I would be great since I had paralegal experience. I slid into the opportunity and soon met with Eminem regularly to review the club's records. 
I check references on prospective members, identified addresses on applications, alerted Eminem on fictitious or incomplete criminal histories. I made copies, one for the feds and one for Eminem. I provided synopsises of my findings and Eminem seemed pleased. And with his paperwork in order, he could now turn to more pressing issues, killing Hell's Angels. At first, he proposed that we randomly burn houses around the Charlotte and North Carolina clubhouses and smoke them out. The Hell's Angels might plan to use them as fronts to launch attacks against the outlaws. Snuff suggested we start with the Hell's Angels tattoo shop in Richmond, adding that killing the owner would be a great way for us to earn our SS bolts. This was war, not crime. Snuff suggested we start with a high-powered rifle from the bed of a pickup truck and blow the Hell's Angels away while he smoked on his back porch. He was tickled by his ingenuity, then he frowned. If the rifle was too cumbersome, he could teach us how to make bombs. Mostly he wanted our commitment. The murder should happen next week, he said, after he had a chance to obtain professional-grade explosives. Snuff seemed winded by the conversation, and I realized then that I was looking at an old man. In his mid-fifties, Snuff aged like a dog, seven years at a stretch. He had been a criminal a long time, had already served 12 years in prison for initiating violent acts against a member of another motorcycle gang. Killing was breakfast conversation, as significant to him as discussing coffee brands. He expects us to kill next week, I frowned. Eminem discussed a possible alibi with Gringo just in case things got shitty. A month later, Eminem was still working on the explosives issue. Meanwhile, Les shared how he'd assaulted a Hells Angel the week before in Rock Hill, South Carolina. The rival had strayed too close to the outlaws' clubhouse. No more free travel, he declared. No rival club had permission to pass through outlaws' territory without risking attack. Then he suggested any number of ways the agents and I could retaliate if we ever saw a stray, beatings, burnings, even grenades. Impatient with our lack of progress, Snuff suggested we conduct surveillance to facilitate the assaults, find the enemy, and at the next regional bosses meeting in Lexington, members produced maps that highlighted the Hells Angels' clubhouses and homes. The marks resembled yellow blood spatter. Murder, of course, was out of the question. We all knew that. We just needed a clever way to extricate ourselves from the plot without arousing suspicion, without blowing the investigation, without revealing our cover. We had to finesse the ending, position our players for the takedown, and thwart an all-out war. 